So we're talking about the loudness of a sound. How loud is a sound? It's measured by a quantity called intensity, the units of which are watts per meter squared. Now watts is itself a unit of is joules per second, energy per time. So the quantity of loudness is measured by energy per time per area. So how much energy arrives from a sound wave per time over some area that catches it. Now, I do not give you, I've not given you the entire formula, but I will tell you the proportionality that's important is that the intensity of a sound is proportional to the amplitude of the sound squared. Now, for sound waves, of course, we have two complementary pictures of amplitude. We can talk about it as displacement amplitude, which is measured in meters and SI, or as a pressure amplitude, which is measured in pascals. Okay. Um, and so we talked about what can you do with a proportionality if you don't have the equation itself. You can talk about things like if you triple the amplitude, then the intensity is how affected how? Nine. Nine times. So, I mentioned last time that we don't usually, or we don't only use intensity to describe sound, and the reason why is it's not the most handy unit. Let me, in fact, give you some typical intensities of sounds that you may have heard. Um, let me find it here. So, we can start with something called the threshold of hearing. This is the softest sound, like the quietest sound that you can tell the difference between it and complete silence in the most, the best conditions. And there, the value is 10 to the minus 12 watts per meter squared, roughly. At least order of magnitude, okay, which means the right power of 10. Obviously, everyone's ears are not exactly the same. Some people are hard of hearing, and they, um, some people are particularly uh, have sensitive ears, but this is roughly where human beings come in. So in order to tell a sound from silence, you only need to have 10 to the minus 12 joules arriving per second per square meter. That's pretty amazing, but we haven't survived on this planet this long without having some advantages, right? Some evolutionary advantage. Now, you can go up through the range of human experience to, you know, whispering and leaves rustling, to normal conversation, to street traffic, to, uh, you know, all the way up to, say, some of the loudest sounds that you might normally experience, let's say a rock concert. That's about one watt per square meter. Now, I want to point out that we have just gone through a trillion orders of magnitude. In order to get from the threshold of hearing to a rock concert, you have to multiply by 10 to the 12, okay? We might as well go up here to the threshold of pain. This is when you start to become incapacitated by the sound about 10 watts per square meter. It's an amazing range of abilities that we have. So obviously it's important from an evolutionary standpoint to stick around is to be able to experience a wide range of input, right? You have to be able to hear a saber-toothed tiger sneaking up on you, right? So you need a, a low threshold of hearing but when it roars, it needs to not knock you over in pain so that it can eat you. So you also need a high threshold of pain as well, right? Um, the threshold of pain, by the way, I should mention, this number is also not a fixed number that's agreed upon by everyone. Some people will say that the threshold of pain is right around a rock concert, or one watt per square meter, and as to whether or not they set it to a rock concert or higher, I have a feeling that's probably most related to the age of the uh, author that's uh, writing the, the, um, the, uh, the standards here. 
Um, so this scale is so vast. If we're talking of the order of a trillion, I guarantee you that I can, uh, if, if I gave you a trillion sounds of different loudness, you could not rank them. That's too fine, right? So the payoff, the, the trade-off for being able to hear at a wide range of different intensities is that our ear is not, is not that uh, precise. It actually measures more in terms of what bin we are in terms of power of 10, okay? So you can't tell the difference between 1 times 10 to the minus 12 and 1.1 times 10 to the minus 12. Those two sound about the same, but you can tell when you go from 10 to the minus 12 to say 10 to the minus 11 or 10 to the minus 10, right? You can't tell, you have a much more rough uh, experience with sound, and that's where the decibel scale comes in, okay? So the decibel scale compresses this into more human terms. So it's a non-SI way of measuring loudness that's basically tailor-made for the human experience, and that's how you often know right away that's why it's not SI, right? If we're going to make something specifically for humans, then you're kind of uh, not doing anything so fundamental anymore, right? Just like atmospheric pressure, right? If you're in atmospheric pressure in, atmos in SI units, it's... Uh, 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals, but there's also this other unit called an atmosphere where we call that one, one atmosphere. It's tailor-made to the human experience, right? We're taking where we live and calling it one. So that's what we're gonna do with the decibel scale as well. Let me tell you how it's defined. This is the someone named decibel hence the name, uh, came up with this way of defining loudness, and he just made up the formula, and I'll explain to you why he designed it with the features that it has. So the input here is the intensity in SI units in watts per square meter. And what you're going to do is you're going to take the ratio of your intensity divided by the lowest sound that a human can hear, that's the threshold of hearing, this gets a special character called I naught. Okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to figure out how many times more is your sound in intensity than the minimum sound where your ear picks up. Okay? So that ratio can be 10 or 1, or in the case of a rock concert, the ratio will be a trillion. Okay? Um, then you take the log of it. Now log, you guys hopefully have seen in math class, log base 10, yes? So log is a special function which is the inverse function of 10 to the. So log of 10 to the x is x. Or vice versa, 10 to the log of x is x. They kill each other, right? It's like a tan and an inverse tan. Right? They basically just are designed to be uh, take the other one away. It only works with 10, right? You can't say log of 5 to the x is x. It's a special function that works with 10. They have other logs, log base 5 or log base 2 or whatever. They even have something called a natural log, right? Where it's the special number it works with is called what? E, right? 2.71828, etc. So this is a log base 10, okay? Remember, it only works with 10. If you have trying to take the log of another number, you're going to need your calculator. But if it's 10, you can do it. <coughs> it's really easy, okay? So then, you once you've done the log of that ratio, you multiply by 10 as well. And I'll explain why you might want it to multiply by 10. And then this. This is the Greek letter beta, and that's going to be your loudness in decibels. And we just want to pick a letter for it because we want the units to be decibels. We don't want the variable to be decibels. So just like 
the units of I are watts per square meter, the units of beta are decimals. Okay? So let's try it out. Let's, let's go ahead and just take the, some of these values that we just did and uh, throw them into the scale. So let's take what happens when the intensity is itself the threshold of hearing. Well, we're going to get beta equals 10 times log of I naught over I naught. And so the ratio now is going to be 1 inside the log, right? Now you may already know what the log of 1 is, but if you don't, it, yeah, that's right. One of the ways we can avoid doing it by hand, or by with a calculator rather, is turning it into 10 to the something. Now here we get lucky because anything to the 0 is 1, right? So we might as well make it 10, because then log of 10 to the 0 is 0. And multiply by 10, still 0, right? So this tells us that the threshold of hearing is 0. Well, hey, why not? That sounds perfect. Let's, wherever our ear starts, let's put the origin, right? Now, are there softer sounds than 10 to the minus 12 that you can hear if you're a mouse or a bat or something? Sure. Those would be negative decibels. But let's start our origin where our ear starts, then everything will either be 0 or higher than 0, right? Makes sense. Just like we might come up with some pressure units where, where we live is 1, we might come up with a loudness scale where our ear starts, we set the 0 of that scale there. All right? So let's try another one. Let's try the rock concert. I equals 1. Watt per square meter, so we'll throw that in there. 10 log of, and now I'm just going to put in the numbers. So that's 1 watt per square meter divided by our baseline, which is 10 to the minus 12. All right, so 1 over 10 to the minus 12, that's 10 to the 12, right? So we get log of 10 to the 12. The ratio of a rock concert's loudness to the threshold of hearing is 1 trillion, 10 to the 12. What's log of 10 to the 12? 12. You can see why they use a log for this, right? Because it cuts down these huge things. 10 to the 12 is huge. 12 is not huge, right? So we use a log so that we can basically worry about the number that's in the exponent instead of the, the fact that it's actually a huge number, right? So instead of 10 to the 12, we use 12, right? So this right here is just 12. In fact, this is why you have the factor of 10 in the front, because the scale would be too compressed if it wasn't. We'd, the scale would run from the threshold of hearing to a rock concert, that would be 0 to 12. Now you can rank more than 12 sounds in order of loudness, right? So we don't want it to get too compressed. Although I should mention there's something in chemistry where they don't multiply by 10, so you do have a pretty compressed scale. Does anyone know what that is? pH, right? So same, similar kind of thing. In this case, we multiply by 10, so we get 120. So we've just compressed this scale greatly. In fact, try it out with the threshold of pain. As I've defined it here, you'll find that that's 130. We've just compressed all of this vast amount of human experience into a scale from 0 to 130. Everyone can understand what, what numbers from 0 to 130, can't they? If I gave you 130 sounds, you could probably rank them in order of loudness, right? You know, even a lay person who says, why is this number small and in the corner? They have no idea what scientific notation is, but we can make it more digestible using the decibel scale, right? We've just taken the threshold of hearing to the threshold of pain, and we put it on a scale from 0 to 130, okay? So, 
Um, you can certainly use this equation, like I've just done it, to show you uh, uh, um, various decibel correspondences to various intensities. Uh, but let me show you a rule of thumb that's your friend, okay? For every factor of 10 that the intensity increases by, you add 10 decibels. There are several homework questions that ask you to use this relationship. In fact, it's primarily what I'm going to want you to do out of this. So, this, along with the intensity amplitude relationship, is something that I expect you to be able to work in either direction. And I'll do some examples. Okay? I will do some examples where I work it um, in both directions. So let me, for instance, in my example, let me suppose I have two sound waves, um, sound wave one and sound wave two. Sound wave one has an amplitude A, and sound wave 2 has an amplitude of, I don't know, let's make it 100 times that. It has 100 times the amplitude, okay? So what does that mean about the intensity? Million? 100 squared. Is that the, right? 0, 0, 0, 0. There we go. Right? So if sound wave 2 is 100 times the amplitude, it's 10,000 times the intensity, right? Now, let's pop over to the decibel side. Well, this is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, right? Remember, every factor that you multiply the intensity by, that adds 10 decibels. So on the decibel side, however loud this is, what's 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10? 40. That's 40 decibels louder. So sound wave 2 is 40 decibels louder. You see how that worked? Now, if you don't believe me, let's examine our previous findings. Our previous findings was a, that the threshold of hearing was 0 decibels, a rock concert was 120, and the threshold of pain was 130. Okay? Let's check it out. Does this rule of thumb really work as advertised? Well, we had the threshold of hearing, I naught, which is 10 to the minus 12. And then I have the rock concert, which was uh, 1. So if I call this i, how many times is this? What do I have to multiply this by to get this? Trillion. Trillion, 10 to the 12, right? OK, that's 10 times 10 times 10 times. I'm not going to say it 12 times. 10 times 10 times 10, blah, 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 right? Okay? So on the decibel side, I have to add 10 plus 10 plus 10, but I'm not going to say it 12 times. Okay? What happens when you add 10 to itself 12 times? What do you get? 120. So whatever loudness this is, this is 120 decibels more than that. Well, how many decibels was the threshold of hearing? Zero. So if that's zero, then this is what? 120. Does that agree with our previous results? Yes. Yeah. It works. So this is a relationship that you can run backwards and forwards. In this case, I've been running it from amplitude to intensity to decibels, or in this case, just intensity to decibels. We could also work it the other way. So let's do another one run the other way. Are there any questions before I do that? All right, so let's do one the other way. Let's say I have two sound waves, sound wave one and the sound wave two. This one has a certain loudness. This one is 
60 decibels more, okay, let's say. So 60 is 10 plus 10 plus 10, six times, right? So if I work backwards to the intensity, right, how many times more intense is it? What's that? 126? 10 to the 6, yes. Right? So if I have to add 10 6 times on the decibel side, I have to multiply 10 6 times. So 10 to the 6. Okay? Now 10 to the 6, we can work backwards. That's, uh, we can take the square root of that, right, to get the amplitude. Square root, so 10 to the 6 to the 1 half. Let's see, 6 divided by 2 is 3, right? So that's a amplitude of uh, a thousand times more. So you see how we work that backwards? So I, here, I took, just took the square root, right? Square root of 10 to the 6 is 10 to the 3rd. I should mention that sometimes you take the square root, you're not going to get a nice perfect square. That's OK. You just simply some ugly number. But from here to here, it does have to be some 10 or a power of 10, right? So you have to, otherwise, you can't do it because 10 is a special number with log, okay? Um, are there any questions on that? Yeah? So there isn't some kind of constant uh, in your proportionality that doesn't allow you to take the square root of the intensity to get the amplitude? Uh, no, because it is going to be uh, all, like, they are all constants, which means that they are going to be in both sides, right? So if you have i is proportional to amplitude squared, even if there is constants, that's not going to affect the proportionality, right? Like we talked about proportionality is the, yep. the constant form matter. And that's all we're doing here, right? We're not doing equations, we're doing proportionalities. As long as whatever is here is not changing, right? If you increase the amplitude of a sound, then the amplitude is the only active ingredient which affects the intensity. The rest is things that don't change for any sound wave. And that's, I haven't told you that what those constants are, but that they, that's what they are. Um, um, technically speaking, it does, this is more correct for pressure amplitude um, than displacement amplitude, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, so you'll notice on your homework, it almost exclusively tells you the pressure amplitude. Uh, and that's just for me making sure to be correct, even though that's something you need, don't need to worry about at all. Okay, um, okay so I asked you to work that relationship back and forth a little bit on the homework, and you can knock off those problems now. Um, let's talk about standing waves. So this is the subject of your lab. Um, this uh, coming Friday, so we'll see how far we can get with it today. So before we even get into what a standing wave is, um, there's obviously, uh, let me tell you what it is. Um, we've been talking about traveling waves so far, so waves that have some motion, they move left to right. A standing wave is a wave that looks like it just hovers in place in some sense. And you can imagine there's a very different mechanism that would create it. So in order to understand what it, that is, we have to talk about what's something called wave superposition. Okay. Now it's a fancy word, but basically what it means is this. If you have more than one wave on a medium, so not just one, but multiple waves, the medium will do whatever it is that all the waves want. Okay? So the medium behaves as the sum of all the waves on it.
So whenever you go out to the beach, you see wave superposition. Obviously, there's multiple waves. And what is it that the water does? It just does what all the waves that are at a given location would want it to do. They just add them. That's the fancy word for superposition. It's just adding contributions. So one of the things you need to know is that when you have a crest and another crest on a particular part of the medium, and they line up perfectly, you get super crest. You may see two waves come together, right? And then they kind of suddenly it jumps up. If this is a height A from equilibrium and this is a height A, you get this as being height 2 times A. This is a particular type of, uh, of wave superposition called constructive interference. And hopefully the constructive is uh, obvious here, they're coming together in such a way that um, they may make something bigger than either one is alone. It's because they're lined up just right. Now these, by the way, just have to be at the same place at the same time. They could be going the same way, in which case they'll stay together, or they could be going opposite ways, in which case this is going to be a passing thing, right? So you could see something like this, where a crest and a crest are heading together. The moment that they're at the same place, they will, the, the uh, medium will jump up, and then they'll just pass through each other on their way as if nothing ever happened. Okay. So that would be an example of a constructive interference. Now you could have the opposite. If at a given point on the wave you have a crest coming through and then you also have a trough at the same place, well, you can kind of think of these as being opposite. You can almost think of this as being like A and this as being kind of like minus A. And if that's the case, they will add it to nothing. And you, as you might guess, this is called destructive interference. This is when two waves happen to have a superposition where they kill each other. Now that's just if a crest and a trough of equal, uh, uh, crest of a certain height and a trough of equal depth are at the same place at the same time. If they're going the same way, then they can kill each other all the way on down the line. But what we're going to be looking at is when they're traveling in opposite directions. So that might look something like this. The you have a crest heading toward a trough, and the moment that they're in the same place, you suddenly see nothing, and then they travel right through each other as if nothing ever happened. But when they're in the same place, the crest in some sense fills in the trough, and the medium is at equilibrium, it's flat. So, here is what we're going to do. While it's very handy to talk about um, crests, uh, or just isolated crests and troughs heading toward each other, so I can give you the es essential nugget of what constructive and destructive interference is, we're going to collide periodic waves. So waves that continually go like this and go like this. All right? And we're going to see what happens. Now, first I'm going to show you in real life, and then I'll show you on the, um, on the uh, computer where we can get a little bit more of a, a controlled uh, examination of it. So here's my string again. Um, would you mind uh, volunteering here for holding the other end? You can just go in right there somewhere. Okay. So I don't need to use the whole thing. I'll try it like that, maybe. So. If I move my hand up and down, I can just put a traveling wave there. You can see it moving back and forth, right? It goes over there, it bounces back, it travels back and forth, right? But I can also make two waves collide. Um, we don't actually even both need to make waves. All I need to do is I'll make a wave, it'll get over there, it'll bounce, and then I have a wave coming back at me, right? And if I keep on making a wave that goes this way, I will have this. 
So let's see what I get. So I can get something like this. And you notice what you get, it looks like it's kind of hovering in place. Right? It doesn't look like it's really moving left or right, it's just kind of moving up and down. This is what's called a standing wave. Now you notice that there's a huge jump in the middle, right? There's a massive uh, um, point on the middle that oscillates a lot, way more than my hand is moving. And the reason why is in the middle there, there is constructive interference. All the waves that are tra traveling in both directions are lining up perfectly there to make super crests. Okay. Let me try another one. I'll try making another standing wave. Here's another one. Oh, I don't see. If you don't get it just right, as you guys will discover in lab this Friday, then you won't get one. Let me try it again. There we go. So there's another standing wave. It doesn't look like it's moving left or right. It just looks like it's kind of standing in place, right? It's oscillating up and down, but it's not going left or right. Now here you can see there's a point right in the middle where it never moves. Now how is that happening? Well, it turns out that the wave traveling to the left and the wave traveling to the right are always destructively interfering there. So whenever the crest of one is coming through, the trough of the other is coming through. They always cancel. There are also points to either side where you can see that it's jumping up a lot, right? That's where there's constructive interference. So we get this thing called the standing wave by um, sending two waves colliding with each other. And there'll be points where they always kill each other, destructive. By the way, that point in the middle, as we'll call it, is called a node. So a node is a point where destructive interference always happens. And then the points that jump up the most, they're called anti-nodes. That's where the most constructive interference is happening. I'll try another one. Let me try to make another standing wave. Now, I'm going to have to move my hand progressively faster, higher frequency, because I want a lower wavelength. So, here's another one. There should be now two nodes in the middle, right? There are two points in the middle that don't move and then anti-nodes alternating with it. I'm going to try it for one more. I have to move a very high frequency to get a low wavelength. <laughs> See, there's a bunch of nodes, right? Okay, so those are standing waves. Thank you very much. So, um, these things, the thing that I just did, you guys will get to make these yourself in lab on Friday or Thursday or Friday or whatever, Thursday through Saturday, um, whenever you have that. You won't have to put the elbow grease into it. We have a little uh, wave driver, which is just a little arm that moves up and down. So it's basically acts as your hand for you, okay? Um, you can make these guys. So what I want to do is I want to show you a little bit in detail on the computer um, what was happening there, because obviously we can only see the superposition, we can't see the individual waves that went into it. So here is an animation that shows you both the individual traveling waves, they're red and they're blue, and then the black thing is what you actually witness on the string, which is the superposition of the two. So you can see that the N, uh, let me... Um, let me uh, just remove the individual waves for the moment. You can see the end. These are called nodes again. These are the spots where the wave never moves. Then these A, that stands for anti-node. That's the spot where you, they move the most. Now, I'm not saying that those never pass through equilibrium. They, of course, do. But when, they also oscillate to the maximum distance from either side. In fact, every point on this string is in simple harmonic motion. It's just that points over in the middle here do not have nearly as extreme of an oscillation. They don't, they don't as the anti-nodes do. And then, of course, when you get to a node, well, it's not really oscillating at all because it never moves. So if I add back in the individual waves, you can kind of see how it ends up happening. So notice here, that's when crest and crest make super crest, right? Let me pause it 
when the antinu is in full, in, in full uh, effect here. You can see here, crest and crest, I, I missed it slightly, but basically, crest and crest make super crest, right? So if this is, these are both of a certain height, this is twice that height, right? That's how the antinodes are formed. Whenever one part of the wave is passing from one wave, the other wave is applying exactly the same thing. Now, that's how the antinodes get formed, but let's look at the, how the nodes form. Now, right now, the nodes, of course, both waves are zero, so zero plus zero is zero. But if we look later, let's say right there, how is this not, still not moved? Well, it's because the crest of one and the trough of the other is there simultaneously. And it turns out that whenever one part of the wave passes that point, the opposite part of the other wave is passing, and they always kill each other there, and that's why you get a node. So the whole uh, reason why you get a standing wave is because you have this superposition of two traveling waves that uh, interfere in this way. Now that's a wave on a string, but you can also do it with sound waves. So let me show you standing waves of sound. So if I go over here, um, let me show you uh, this one first. So this would be a pipe with uh, both ends closed. Okay? This is what the actual um, molecules are doing. Um, and that's your standing wave. So what do we have? Well, we learned, of course, that you can explain the uh, sound wave in two different pictures, right? Displacement, which is the actual motion of the particles, and pressure. So here's your displacement amplitude, here's your divergence from your atmospheric pressure. Okay? So let's take a look at these guys here. Well, these air molecules can't move, right? They're pressed against the, uh, um, the side, right? They can't move there, so they do not have any displacement. So that's our node, right? We have nodes on both ends uh, in terms of the displacement. They're, they're, um, they can't move there. There's nowhere for them to move, right? Versus here, in the middle, they are free to move back and forth. And in fact, if you look at a particle toward the middle of the tube, it's moving the most. And so that is your displacement antinode. Now, if we flip over to the other picture, right, we said that there's two ways to describe sine waves, displacement or pressure. So you can describe the amplitude in either way. And here's the thing. Where the uh, crest is of the displacement is not where the crest is of the pressure. The only thing that I need you to get out of that is for you to realize that when you have a displacement node, you have a pressure antinode and vice versa. So when you, the air molecules have maximum motion, then the pressure doesn't change. And when they have no motion, you have maximum pressure change. And let me try to explain to you. Imagine that this was a crowd of people. Maybe you're at a rock concert. If you're right next to the barrier, you can't move. You're worried about being crushed. I mean, if you go to a concert, don't ever try to get something next to the barrier. I know it's nice to have something to lean on, but when people get crushed at a concert, it's because they're next to the barrier, okay? So if you can't move, you will be subject to the largest pressure variation. And in fact, because you can't move, because you can't displace, you get ultimately crushed and pulled apart, right? You get pulled and then crushed, right? It's the air molecules in the middle that are just moving with the crowd, right? Because they can move. They don't experience any pressure variation, right? That's the safest place to be, right? So because you can move, you have maximum displacement, you don't experience any pressure change. So it's a displacement uh, antinode, it's a pressure node, okay? So that's, uh, you can do this with sound too. And I should point out that this looks very similar to the sound of the thing that I made for you in the class, right? In fact. And I, let me go to a higher one. I made this one for you too, right? So there's your node in the middle, right? 
and I think I made you even the next one. So that one looked like this. So that had two nodes in the middle, right? Just remember that whatever is a uh, node for displacement is an anti-node for pressure and vice versa, okay? So you can do this with sound waves as well. This is actually what the molecules look like. But of course, what we're plotting is displacement along the same axis as the wave motion or pressure variation, okay? And again, I did post these applets for you so you can play around with these yourself. Um, so you can do this on a string. You can do this with sound. You can do this with any wave. You can even make standing waves in light or other waves. So this is a property of any time you have a wave. So um, I guess I should catch myself up here. When you have two waves that interfere, you get what's called a standing wave. You have these points called nodes, where it's always destructive. They never move. You get these points called anti-nodes, where it's always constructive. And for sound waves, you have, when you have a displacement node, that's a pressure anti-node. And when you have a displacement anti-node, it's a pressure node. Okay. So, now that we kind of understand why, what's, why we see what we see, we see this wave that seems to kind of hover in place, it doesn't drift to one side or the other, it's a result of the superposition of traveling waves, we now want to understand what its properties are. Okay? And most importantly, um, you saw this in the demo, if I don't move my hand right, you get some ugly mess. You get some superposition that is not a nice standing wave. So let me draw the things that I managed to get. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. And here's the third one. They look like this. Those are your standing waves, the first three. And it does go on. And here's what I want to point out the pattern is. You kind of have to have a node on the ends, because the ends don't really move. If one end is completely tied down and the other well, technically my hand was there, but it doesn't move that much. The ends kind of have to be nodes. That's the boundary condition. So you can't have anything willy-nilly, because if there wouldn't be a node on the end, it kind of doesn't fit onto this string. So the boundary conditions mean that not all wavelengths will work. So we're going to find out that there's actually a discrete set of these where the wavelength is just right that they will form these standing waves. And we'll work out what that equation is at the beginning of Wednesday.